leadership and worship. If you were here last week, you heard and saw that our attention has finally shifted from the visions of seal judgments and trumpet judgments and bowl judgments and pictures of God's pouring out of His wrath on unbelievers and fighting with Satan to a rather grand and marvelous picture of worship that's taking place in heaven now and will take place in heaven in some fashion for all eternity where the only thing left to shout is hallelujah. Praise God. This week and next week are our final two weeks in this winter series on the book of Revelation and the people of God said, Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Had someone say to me this morning, when are we ever going to finish Revelation? And I can appreciate that. Believe me, being the one doing the research and the study, these closing chapters 20, 21, and 22 further describe the things that will look like and be like when Jesus returns as He has Promised. So if you have your copy of God's Word, I'd like to go ahead and invite you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. Dr. Ken Easley, professor of biblical studies at Union University in Jackson, Tennessee, wrote the following story at the beginning of chapter 20 in his commentary on the book of Revelation. He writes, My family's favorite get-together pastime for long winter evenings is solving jigsaw puzzles. As our son grew older, we progressed in steps from 50-piece puzzles to really challenging 1,000-piece puzzles. Often a new puzzle finds its way under our Christmas tree, and as I have shopped toy, stories, toy stores for puzzles, I have found one of the cleverest and most difficult puzzles of all. So far, I've not had the courage to buy one. It's the jigsaw puzzle with two solutions. There are parts of very different pictures, usually a landscape and a portrait, on opposite sides of the puzzle pieces. Therefore, the most challenging task of all lies at the beginning, deciding which side of the puzzle to be worked and then trying to turn the pieces in the right direction so that they can be fit together. The same kind of thing seems to be taking place in the first Ten verses of Revelation 20, some of you might even say for the entire book of Revelation, given the historical debate over these verses, it's safe to say that the solution offered or the position taken on this thing that we call the millennium, the thousand years, often seems to depend entirely on which side of the pieces are facing up at the beginning. Applying this little analogy that Ken easily uses of the double-sided puzzle to Revelation 20, the historical puzzle pieces have tended to fall onto one of these two sides. You have what we call premillennialism. It's often sometimes referred to as millennialism. Those two words used interchangeably, premillennialism and millennialism, where the return of Jesus will be followed by the visible earthly kingdom of Christ and His people on earth that lasts for a literal 1,000 years. After which time there will be one final battle where all the human rebels that remain will be crushed. The devil will finally be cast into eternal torment. The final judgment of humanity will occur and at last there will be a new heaven and a new earth. That is side one of the puzzle pieces. Premillennialism. The other side is something known as amillennialism. Ah being the Greek word or the Greek way of uh, posing a negative, no millennialism. A view of the end times where Jesus' return is preceded, comes before by an invisible, spiritual kingdom of Christ and His people. And it lasts not for a literal thousand years, but for a figurative period of time from Jesus' first coming until His second coming. And then after this, one final battle, human rebels crushed, the devil finally cast into torment, final judgment, a new heaven and a new earth. This, by the way, uh, the amillennial view 
for those of you that are interested, is the position that I presently take on the millennium. But, continuing with this little analogy of the puzzle pieces, as poor as it may be, the puzzle pieces themselves represent the millennium. Clearly, because there are puzzle pieces before us, there is a millennium. We can't escape that. Likewise, all who believe the Bible, those of us that believe in the Scripture, believe in a millennium. There's no denying this. The disagreement about the millennium is whether or not it should be thought of as literal or figurative, whether it should come before Jesus comes back or whether it is inaugurated after Jesus comes back. So those are the arguments at play generally when we look at Revelation 20 and the end, Jesus coming and inaugurating His kingdom. Someone aptly said the millennium is a thousand years of peace that Christians like to fight about. And the sad truth is that we shouldn't fight about this at all. In preparing for today's message, I was listening to a sermon by a New Testament theologian and pastor Dr. Tom Schreiner. Dr. Schreiner's writings have been especially helpful to me during this series as he preached through the book of Revelation back in 2009. And as he did so, he preached through and presented Revelation from a particular theological perspective, as I have, and with a particular view of the millennium uh, in view. And as he got through the first 19 chapters, he came to chapter 20 and completely changed his mind on the millennium after having preached the first 19 chapters with this particular view in mind. And so when he got to Revelation 20... This is how he opened his sermon. Everything in God's Word is important, isn't it? Still good Christians have different views on the millennium. A month ago, and during this whole series, I would have said that I'm an amillennialist. But I've actually changed my mind as I've studied this passage. So I mean, how much trust are you going to put in me right now? I'm not very stable on this issue. You know, that's a good thing to be reminded of that our confidence is not in a preacher, but in God's Word. It's in the truth of God's Word. That's what matters, not my opinion towards something. I think we also learn from this to be charitable towards different views. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind, at least as if you can be. And we must distinguish between central issues of the faith and issues which aren't central. Some people have a hard time doing that. Everything for them is of equal importance in the Bible, but that's not true, is it? There are some things that are non-negotiable in our faith. The Trinity is non-negotiable. The authority of Scripture is non-negotiable. The substitutionary atonement, justification by faith alone, the deity of Christ, and of course I could mention other things. But there are, all, are less clear matters in the Bible as well. Things like when the rapture will take place and what we're looking at today regarding the millennium. We must beware of being divisive and schismatic and inflexible on matters that are less important. That really shows, I think, a character flaw in us. Something that God wants to work on in us. And we need to be aware of being namby-pamby, don't we? That's another problem, isn't it? Not holding to strong convictions. We want to speak the truth of the Gospel in love. That's what's crucial. We need balance. I need balance that comes from the Holy Spirit. We all need that. We need the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. And I would just say, well said from a brilliant theologian who's a little unstable on this particular passage of Scripture. So in the time that we have left this morning, rather than engage in speculation and even argumentation for a particular view of Jesus' second coming, Will it be before or after the thousand years? And will that thousand years be literal or will it be figurative? Rather than do all of that, I want to speak to you with conviction about five truths that I think we do see affirmed in Revelation 20. There may be a lot for us to debate in this chapter, but these five things are certain. First, God is sovereign. That's, that's a statement, that is a 
point that is a reality that you have heard me say over and over and over, and it should be something that is preached from this pulpit on a regular basis. And I think the reason that that is so, and the reason that I have repeated it over and over and over again is because two things. Number one, we have a tendency to forget things. And I also think that because the Bible constantly talks about it, God knows that we need to be reminded about it. So regardless of what's happening in this world, no matter who's elected president, no matter what happens in your world this week, rejoice in this. God is always on the throne. Take a sigh of relief that God is sovereign and He's always on the throne. Our hope is most definitely not in whatever bill or reform or agenda is up for a vote this week. Be engaged, yes. Be informed, that's fine. Even take a stand. We're called to do that. But after all the time and the energy that we spend on these things and the interests and the things that move us, we need to take at least a moment to remind ourselves that God is sovereign. Our hope is most definitely not in whatever new drug or new surgery or new treatment is on the market today. Visit the doctor, yes. Consult specialists, absolutely. Even take steps to cure things such as the diagnosis of a disease or cancer or Alzheimer's. That's fine, but please hear me say all of those things, as good as they are, after the time and the energy and the emotion and the due diligence that we spend on healing ourselves physically, brothers and sisters, we need to take a brief moment and remind ourselves that despite all of that, God is still sovereign. He's still on the throne of our lives. Our God is sovereign. He's King of kings. He's Lord of lords. He's over presidents and rulers and nations. He's over cancer and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and heart disease. The Lord God Almighty is even sovereign. Even sovereign over sin and death and Satan. So day after day, week after week, year after year, be reminded your God, my God, is sovereign over all. Secondly, Satan is subordinate. Regardless of which position of the end times that you take, it is clear from all Scripture that Satan is limited and bound, at least in some sense. He does not, never has had free reign in this world. And he does not have free reign in your life or in mine. Folks, Satan is limited in what he can do by the sovereign and limitless power of of the sovereign God. What's even better than that? He's doomed for destruction and he knows it. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 29, Jesus has just finished healing two demon-possessed men and the demons approach Jesus and say this, Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Demons know there is an appointed time for their defeat. And Satan knows this too. Revelation 12 told us that. Satan is filled with anger because he knows that his time is short. The ultimate battle has already been fought and won. Satan has lost. He's doomed to be defeated. Now follow me here. If the devil knows this for certain, if the demons know this for certain, then you and I can know this for certain. Satan is subordinate to God. He's subordinate. He doesn't rule in this world. Third, the gospel will advance through the church. The gospel of the kingdom of Christ will be proclaimed as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. That's a guarantee directly from Jesus' mouth in Matthew 24, verse 14. That's exactly what Jesus says to His disciples as they specifically ask Him, when it is that the end will come. I'm not going to ask you to turn over to Matthew 24, but you may want to just make a little note of that here in Revelation 20. The disciples asked Jesus point blank 
in Matthew 24, verse 3, what will be the sign of your coming again and of the end of the age? It doesn't get any clearer than that. What's the sign that you're coming back again and that the end of all time is before us? And Jesus talks about not being led astray by false prophets and teachers and wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes and tribulations. And then he says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. Jesus doesn't mention in Matthew 24, he doesn't mention at all the thousand years. No mention of what would come in Revelation Was it before or was it after? No mention of whether the thousand years was to be literal or figurative. All Jesus says is that the end of the world will come when the gospel has been proclaimed to all the nations. You heard me pray it this morning. Men and women, boys and girls from all nations and tribes and languages and tongues will be represented around the throne of God. We saw that in Revelation chapter 7. The image in my mind as I sing some of the songs that we sing of the beautiful picture of God's family, God's children, of every race and culture, every color, every size and shape gathered around His throne, holding hands, uniting their voices in praise and worship before God. And however you understand the end of the world coming together, whether the thousand years is before or after, literal or figurative, know that His gospel, His good news, His salvation through His Son Jesus will be proclaimed to the ends of the earth before that time happens. Fourth, Jesus will return for the church. Jesus will return for the church. When How, what happens before or after His return may be open for discussion this morning, but His return is certain. Folks, we hope, we long for, we look for His coming. Listen to some of these statistics. One scholar has estimated that there are 1,845 references to Jesus' second coming in the Old Testament with 17 books in the Old Testament giving it prominence. In the 260 chapters of the New Testament, there are 318 references to Jesus' return. An amazing one out of every 30 verses. 23 of the 26 New Testament books refer to this great event, Jesus' second coming. And for every prophecy in the Bible concerning Christ's first coming, there are eight which look forward to His second coming. Folks, the second coming of Christ, His return for the church, is so central that if you go to any Bible-believing church, whether you go to their website or whether you go to their church and ask for it, and they give you things that they believe as orthodox belief, you will see that one of the things that that church proclaims to be true is that Christ will come back. We claim it. This church claims that one of the central things we believe is that Jesus will come back. The Scripture teaches it. Revelation 20 declares it. Jesus will return. And fifth and finally at the end. Every person will be judged by God. This is where I want to slow down for just a minute and let that sink in. Maybe for the first time, maybe a little bit deeper this time. At the end of your life, at the end of my life, whether we die before Christ returns or whether it happens when He comes back and we're still here on the planet. At the end of time, as you and I know it now, every single one of us will stand before a holy and an almighty God. And I know that there are some of you that will want to take issue with me on this point, but put that aside for just a moment. 
and think about this. All of us, every single person, you, me, our family, our friends, our neighbors, the guy at the gas station, the colleague in the office down the hall will one day stand before Almighty God. And books will be open. Revelation 20 and verse 12. And they will be laid out in front of us. And records of everything that we've said, everything that we've done, everything that we've thought, every desire, every inclination will be laid bare before us and a holy God. And folks, there are scores of people who are hoping that on that day, their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds. All kinds of church attending people are hoping that their good works of going to church and doing good things in the church are going to outweigh the bad on that day. Many, many people have put their eternal hope and confidence in their good outweighing their bad. But that is not what the Bible says determines your or my eternal destiny. And said there will be two questions. I believe that we will hear in some form, that we will address in some form on that day. The first is, did we put our faith in Christ's Word? There's two books here in Revelation 20. There are books that contain our deeds, and then there's a book of life. Verse 12 and verse 15 of Revelation 20 speak specifically of multiple books, plural. And it calls out one of them in particular, the book of life. It's a reference to everyone who's trusted in the saving work of Jesus Christ on their behalf. And the Bible is absolutely clear that all of our deeds, even the best... Even the noblest of our deeds are deserving of eternal separation from God. We are not holy as He is holy. Every single one of us here today, the richest, the youngest, the oldest, the poorest, the smartest, the dumbest, all of us have stumbled and failed. We've rebelled against God and we deserve eternal separation from Him. But God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to live the life we could not live, to take the punishment of death that we deserve, to conquer the enemy that we could not conquer, sin, death, and Satan. That's God's work. That's His life, His death, His resurrection. And anyone who turns from themselves and turns from their sins and trusts in Jesus as their Lord and Savior and King will be saved on that day of judgment and welcomed into the presence of God. Not based on our work, but based on the work of Christ. The question that you and I have to ask is, is our name in the book of life? Have you trusted in Christ? If not, start today. The second question that I believe is, was there evidence of our faith in Christ? You say, okay, so... What do these other books represent? I'm going to answer that, but first let me show you that these books of our deeds are mentioned in other places outside of Revelation. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come with His angels in the glory of His Father, and then He will repay each person according to what He has done. That's from Jesus. Romans 14, 12. Paul says, So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. 1 Corinthians 3.13, each one's work will become manifest for the day, capital D, day, will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Some people read these verses and hear these verses and wonder, well then, Are my works and are my deeds the basis on whether or not I'll get into heaven? The answer is absolutely not. Jesus' work on the cross alone is the basis of our salvation. You and I cannot earn God's eternal life. What these other books then represent are the evidence of 
that previous faith. The Bible is clear that if there is no fruit of faith, then there is really no faith. Will there be evidence of our faith? If you look at the people that we've seen in the book of Revelation that reign with Christ, those who were beheaded and persecuted and didn't take the mark of the beast, they didn't get into heaven because of their deeds. The basis of their salvation was the work of Christ, but the proof of their faith was the fact that they were beheaded. The proof of their faith was the fact that they didn't take the mark of the beast. The proof, the evidence of their faith was demonstrated in the fact that they were persecuted. For you and me today, brothers and sisters, this raises all sorts of questions. Are we being faithful in our worship? Are we being faithful in our witness, in our spoken testimony? Are we fighting against Sin, not that we're perfect, but are we actively struggling and relying on the strength that God gives us through Jesus Christ to overcome temptations of all kinds? Do we trust Him in the midst of suffering and trial? For many of you, many of you, one of the evidences of your faith is to trust Christ, to trust Jesus in your words and your actions while you suffer physical disease. Listen to this. We have all been privileged, every single one of us, to watch Lynette die. Now for some of you, for those that don't know Lynette or the situation or don't know me, that may sound cold, it may sound harsh, it may sound to you downright mean, but it is true. Her dying days, Lynette is giving to all of us evidence of her faith in Jesus Christ by her demeanor and her words and her spirit. She's showing all of us, including myself, what it looks like to trust Him in the face of death. Will there be evidence of our faith? I want to close this morning by reading a few lyrics from a song that many of you know. Rock of Ages. It was written by an English clergyman by the name of Augustus Toplady. Certainly a name that we don't hear often. I often find that reading or hearing the lyrics of some of the hymns that we sing does a better job of getting the message across because when we're singing, we're more concerned about the notes and making sure that we're singing it correctly. And so sometimes it's good just to pull out the hymnal and read the hymns. Now these are some of the lyrics from Rock of Ages. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. Nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross I cling. While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Have you put your trust, your faith, in the work of Christ on the cross of Calvary? And as you do that and you are transformed by the gift of the Holy Spirit, will the evidence of your life prove the profession of faith that you claim? Those are the questions that all of us will face. Let's pray.